it is uh, almost impossible to imagine uh, the amount of courage and strength and self-determination that a woman born into slavery, orphaned as a child, um, run out of her own city of Memphis for writing about lynching, what it took to actually do that. She is Ida B. Wells. My name is Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. I consider Ida B. Wells my spiritual grandmother because uh, she is really the template on which I've tried to base my own journalistic career. She was a woman who would go into an area where a black man or woman had literally just been strung up and started asking questions. How many of us would, would have the courage to do that even today? She had a, such a strong sense of justice, of right and wrong, and she was a woman who, as her uh, great nephew said, did not suffer fools. She was not going to be silent just because people wanted her to be silent, and she was moral. She understood that this was a, an immoral practice and that white journalists were not going to tell these stories. Lynching was something that many kind of uh, moneyed black people didn't want to talk about. Uh, they had bought into the white narrative that black men were being lynched because they were raping white women, and so they found it distasteful and not helpful to the cause. Ida B. Wells showed that that was a lie, that oftentimes black men were being lynched because of economic retaliation or because they were, they were getting out of their place. And so because of her tireless work, the NAACP began to champion this cause of anti-lynching. She innovated a lot of investigative reporting techniques that we even use today. She was one of the original data reporters. There was no real collection of information on how many black people were being lynched and she began to really record the number of lynchings and what the reasons were. She also was a feminist. She tried to push the white feminist movement and white suffragist movement to include black women and the rights of black women and kind of refused to be sidelined. She also was a very strong advocate for uh, lower income black people, particularly black southerners who were migrating to Chicago. She used a lot of her own money to help those uh, new migrants get established and to advocate on their behalf. The same racial hierarchies that you see in American society, you also see in newsrooms. And investigative reporting is considered the premier job in any newsroom. It's the most expensive, um, it takes the most time, and it has the greatest impact. A lot of times black journalists don't get the opportunities, we don't get the mentorship and the training, and even the chances to do this type of work. So a few years ago, uh, I helped co-found the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting, and the mission of our work is to try to increase the numbers of black investigative reporters in newsrooms. We named our organization after Ida B. Wells, one, because I consider her the most boss uh, black investigative reporter and one of the most boss investigative reporters in the history of our country. But also we really wanted to show that there is a long legacy of black journalists doing this type of reporting. I think that black people are largely written out of the uh, histories and the stories of America. And I think black women have largely been written out of the histories and the stories of the civil rights movement. She helped co-found the NAACP, even though later her legacy was kind of written out of the telling of that, often because uh, the men in the civil rights movement were sexist. So black women, of course, are having to deal with both racism and sexism. And these stories um, just haven't really been told. That's why it's our job not to wait for other people to tell our stories, but for for us to tell our stories and to pass down our legacies amongst ourselves.